Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to continue our multi-part series of videos discussing the frequency response of a linear dynamic system. Over the course of the last few discussions we've built up a good foundation and understanding of Bode plots and frequency domain analysis of a linear system. If you haven't had a chance to watch these videos I would recommend taking a moment to pause, go back and check out these two videos here to make sure you've got the appropriate prerequisites before jumping into the discussion today. You can get to those videos either in a URL in the description below or by clicking on the link right up here. So, that being said, what I'd like to talk about today is we want to generate some real intuition and gain some understanding of how individual components of a transfer function contribute to an overall Bode plot. So, in other words, I'd like to talk about understanding and sketching slash drawing um, individual Bode plot components. plot components. Okay, so to refresh everyone's memory, right, where we were going with all this or where we came from here was, again, we're understanding the frequency response of a system here where I excite the system with an A sine omega t, right, a pure sinusoid, and we saw that at steady state here, right, after the transients have died away here, we saw that, okay, you still get this amplitude, but this amplitude is now magnified by G of J omega times sine omega t plus theta here. So there was some amplification here and there was some phase shift here. And we saw here that the amplification factor of this system here was given by magnitude of g of j omega, right? So this was really just a complex number here. So its magnitude is basically the real part of g of j omega squared plus the imaginary part of g of j omega squared, and then you take the square root, right? And then this theta here, the phase shift here, was basically the angle of this complex number g of j omega, right? Um, and we said that, you know, an easy way to represent that here was uh, an inverse tangent, a uh, four quadrant inverse tangent of basically the imaginary part of g of j omega and the real part of g of j omega. All right, and again, this was assuming here that the way we're using a tan two is you give it the y component and then the x component. Okay, so again, this was the background that we established over the last two videos here, and what we showed last time when we were talking about Bode plots is that you know what, if someone handed you a transfer function here. Well, you could follow a very simple procedure if you understand the fact that the amplification is just you take the transfer function and everywhere you see an S, you replace it with the imaginary number times omega here. Then you can calculate this, ampli uh, this magnitude of the imaginary number and you can calculate the, the phase, right? So we saw that the, uh, let's call it the brute force method for generating a Bode plot. And I think we actually did this explicitly in one of our previous videos here is, well, all you need to do here is just compute first this complex number G of J omega here, right? And then all you need to do here is just get the real part and imaginary part, right? Maybe let's call it alpha and beta here respectively here, right? So, Here's alpha and here's beta, right? The real and imaginary part. And then all you need to do here is just write yourself some code where you brute force blast through and you go ahead and compute the magnitude of G of J omega, right? Using our formula up there, which was just square root of alpha squared plus beta squared, right? And then you go ahead and you compute the angle of G of J omega using our good old friend A tan two of beta and alpha. Right? And then all you're going to do here is basically plot on appropriate axes. Or I guess maybe we should say plot with, how about plot, how about plot with appropriate axes scaling, right? We talked about how the Bode plot in the x-axis is usually a log base 10, and then the magnitude is usually expressed in decibels or 20 times log base uh, 10 of the amplification factor. But again, this is a brute force approach and while it's effective here, right, we don't get any intuition or any understanding of how this transfer function 
influences or turns into a resulting Bodhi plot here. So that's what I want to take care of today here. I want to gain some insight into if I can understand what does this transfer function look like, can I guesstimate or estimate what the Bode plot is going to look like at the end of the day without having to run over to a numerical tool here to brute force blast my way through all of these calculations here. So what we're going to do here today here is we're going to go ahead and approach uh, and analyze seven different components that can make up a given transfer function here. So what we're going to do here is let's just write this down. So we're going to analyze seven different components. These are like the building blocks of transfer functions, right? So I think you all know here, right, that uh, what, can, what can be in a transfer function? Well, you could have a pole here. So let's just write down, how about a single real pole, right? Uh, so f just to maybe uh, sketch this out here, right? So your transfer function in the real imaginary axis, right? You could have a pole like this on the real line, okay? That is definitely a part of a transfer function. I want to understand now if you had just a single real pole, what would the resulting Bode plot look like? The second thing I'd like to look at is how about a single real zero? Again, you could also have uh, a real zero. Something like that could make up your transfer function. The third component I'd like to investigate here is how about a pole at the origin? Right? It's very possible that you have a pole right there. Right? What does that Bode plot look like? Um, and continuing our little pattern, how about a pole, or sorry, a zero at the origin? Right? So I guess this is kind of funny for me to draw it right here, but I think you guys all see what I'm saying here, right? You can have a pole or a zero. Usually you can't have a pole and a zero at the origin, otherwise they'd cancel each other out. But let's consider each one of those one at a time. Okay? What else could you have here? Let's also go ahead and look at how about a pair of complex uh, conjugate poles, right? You might have poles that are out here that are conjugates. The sixth sort of building block or component of a transfer function is how about a pair of complex conjugate zeros, right? So you could have a zero here and a zero here. And then the last component that I like to look up that makes up a transfer function is how about a constant gain? And usually we don't draw that on the, uh, on the real imaginary axis here, but you can obviously see that a transfer function could have a constant gain into it. Okay, so what I want to talk about today then here is let's go through and systematically look at each one of these components one at a time and understand what are their contributions to a Bode plot if they were standing by themselves, okay? So if that sounds like a ton of fun, why don't you give me a moment, I'll erase the board and uh, we'll go ahead and tackle our first item on the list here and investigate a single real pole. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the first component, which is a single real pole. Okay? So what I mean here is let's consider a transfer function which is just made up of a single real pole, nothing else. So I'm going to write it like this. Okay? So here, notice a couple of things here. This is written in what I'm going to call a standard Bode plot form. So what this means here is we can notice that the DC gain of this system is 1 here, right? And we also notice that there's a pole at s is equal to minus p here. Right? And that's it here. So literally, this thing is just made up of just a single pole. Right? Okay, so what can we do now? We want to look at the frequency response of this particular system here. Right? So to look at the frequency response, we are going to do the same thing we've done earlier, right? Which is basically compute g of j omega here. Right? So I take this, we end up with 1 over j omega over p plus one here, right? So you do a little bit of algebra, you do a little bit of manipulation, right, with complex conjugates to get this thing into a real plus an imaginary form, right? So I'm gonna skip these boring um, algebraic manipulations, but you can basically rewrite this thing to look like a alpha plus beta j here, where alpha is equal to uh, this thing, one over 1 plus the quantity omega over p squared, okay? That's alpha, and then beta looks very similar here, except it's minus omega over p all over the same denominator, which is 1 plus quantity omega over p squared, 
right? So here's the real part of g of j omega, and here's the imaginary part of g of j omega, right? Okay, so all we got to do now here is to get the frequency response here is let's look at the magnitude of g of j omega, right? Which we said earlier was just square root of alpha squared plus beta squared. So again, boring algebra. Take these two things, jam it into here, do some algebraic manipulation in Mathematica here, and what you'll end up getting here is this thing. I'm going to go again dot, dot, dot just to skip the boring algebra here, but magnitude of g of j omega you can get this thing to look like this here, right? So it's going to be 1 all over 1 plus a quantity omega over p squared. This thing is all to the 1 half power or square rooted, okay? Okay, now let's do one more step here. If you recall here, on our Bode plot, the magnitude here is not just, we usually don't plot magnitude of g of j omega, we actually plot here, so let's see, recall the Bode plot of magnitude is in units of decibels, right? So in other words, we want to look at 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega, right? So all I got to do is 20 times log base 10 of this entire thing, right? 1 plus omega over p squared. This whole thing in here is to the 1 half. And then end the log base 10. There we go. Okay, so uh, let's just do a couple of uh, calculations here. Okay, so let's uh, let's flip the sign of, uh, of this power here just so I can get this on the numerator. So in other words, what I'm trying to say here is I can write this thing as 20 times log base 10 here of... Uh, 1 plus quantity omega over p squared. This whole thing is now raised to the minus 1 half power. I think everyone would agree I haven't messed with anything, right? Now, remember our our rules with logs here? This power can kind of fall off the log. Remember, I don't know if that's... Uh, that's how I was taught it, right? It's this, this trick of, oh, you're falling off the log here. Uh, okay, so this falls off, so we end up with what? We end up with minus 10 times log base 10 of... Uh, 1 plus quantity omega over p squared. Right? Okay, great. So this here is, again, 20 log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega. Right? So this here is basically the y-axis of the, the magnitude plot in our Bode plot here, right? So this is actually going to be a little bit helpful. Let's go ahead and box him up because we're going to use him in a second. Okay. Um, for, for reference here, I think in my notes I call this thing, let's just be consistent with my notes here, but equation 1.3. Okay. Let's do, uh, we'll save that and we'll come back to him in a second. Um, all right. That's the magnitude, but the other half of the Bode plot is the phase right here. So I need to get the phase of... Uh, g of j omega, right? So I want the angle of g of j omega, right? So we said that that's basically, um, I'm going to use just the, the non four quadrant to inverse tangent for now here, and we're going to see it's not going to matter here, but um, arc tangent of, uh, what is it? It's beta over alpha, right? Inverse tangent. So again, plug in your beta and your alpha into this here. So we end up with, this is tan inverse of, uh, okay, what was beta? Beta was that ugly thing, right? Minus omega over p all over 1 plus quantity omega over p squared, right? This was my um, beta divided by, or I guess I'll flip this, the, the alpha here. So this is now going to be, 1 plus omega over p squared all over 1, right? And then this closes the inverse tangent, great? Okay, so this cancels and this cancels. So this is actually really nice here. The angle formula comes out pretty uh, reasonable, actually. So it's minus omega over p, okay? So here's angle of g of j omega. And again, let's box this up here because this is here is the y-axis 
of the phase plot for the Bode, right? For the Bode plot. And again, maybe let's label this, uh, I don't know, equation 1.4, right? Okay, so here we go. Here's exactly what the magnitude in decibels and the phase angle looks like, right? So what we want to do now here is um, let's make some approximations and see if we can sketch what do these two things look like. So what I mean here is, uh, let's see, I didn't use the board space too well, but I guess we can, we, let's try to do it over here. Let's try to do it over here. Let's go ahead and get, get ourselves some space, and I want to draw out a Bode plot, a blank Bode plot, and then what we're going to do here is try to sketch what these two boxed up functions look like. So I will erase everything except the boxed up functions. Actually, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. Let's move our boxed up over functions over here to the side here, because this is what's going to really matter, okay? So again, I want um, 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega, right? We said that that's this thing. It's minus 10 times log base 10 of 1 plus quantity omega over p squared, right? Okay, that's the, that's the magnitude plot, and then the angle of g of j omega is actually pretty simple, right? It's tan inverse of, uh, what do we say? Oh, it's just minus omega over p. Great, okay, so let's box these up, keep them up in this corner here. Let's get rid of everything else here, and I'm gonna draw my blank Bode plot over here on the right side of the board here, because we're gonna work on it slowly and add to it in a second. So. What I mean by that here is let's draw ourselves a blank Bode plot here. And give yourself a little bit of room. This might, I'm going to try to make this nice and square. Okay, so uh, this is the magnitude plot. So in other words, I'm going to plot on this side 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of G of J omega. Right, and this is in units of decibels. Okay, the x-axis like we talked about earlier was omega here, and it's on a log base 10 scale here. So let's maybe, I'll call this, how about 0.1 radians per second? Let's call this, how about 1 radian per second? Here's 10 radians per second, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess maybe we can go one more just to kind of complete this here. How about 100? Okay, units of radians per second. Okay, and the other half of the Bode plot was our phase plot, right? So I'm going to draw it the same way. Okay, so again, you've got omega in units of rads per second on the x-axis. But now the y-axis here is angle of g of j omega, which was our phase plot. And again, this is typically in degrees or radians. Who cares what you want to use? Um, I guess in my notes I'm using radians. I apologize. I think that's a little bit inconsistent with what I did last time, which, which was in degrees. And most time you'll see it in degrees. But just to keep it consistent with the notes, let's just remember that it's, it's just a, it's just an angle here. You pick if it's if it's radians or degrees. Okay. So here's what we want to do now. We want to plot these two functions on this. Whoops. Sorry. I should have put the exact same markings for the radians. So here again is 0 0.1, 1, 10, and 100. Okay, so I want to plot them here, but what's interesting is let's try to do this using some uh, approximations and intuitions so I don't need to actually run over to a tool to evaluate these at all of these different omegas here, right? So what I want to do here and what we're actually going to do for pretty much all of those seven different components we talked about here is let's consider three cases or three situations here. So situation A here is, let's consider what would happen if you had small frequencies. And small is a relative term here, right? Because uh, what I mean here is, let's consider omegas which are much, much less than P in this case, right? P was our pole location. Uh, the second thing, or the second case I'd like to consider here is, what about if you had the situation where you wanted to look at what is omega exactly when uh, the, uh, omega is equal to p here? So let's consider this is, uh, we're going to see why it's called this later here, but I'm going to call this at the break frequency. This is when omega is equal to p, okay? 
Again, uh, I, I, you just use the term break frequency, but it's going to make sense here in a second here. And the third case here is, let's look at high frequencies. Right? So again, that just means omega is much, much bigger than P here, relatively. Okay? So let's consider those three cases and look at what do these two functions look like in these three cases. So let's look at case A first. Right? This was the small frequencies. In other words, omega was much, much less than P here. Okay? So let's look at this first case. Right? All right, so let's look first at the magnitude plot. Okay? So again, our magnitude is 20 times log base 10 of uh, magnitude of G of J omega. And I'm actually just, I'm just copying what we've got up here just so we can get it all in one place in one clean take. Okay, so now we're in the regime here where omega is much, much less than P here, right? So if you look at this long enough, let me maybe do this in, in another color here in green. Let's look at this term right here, right? If this is true, wouldn't you agree here that I can say, you know what? If omega is less than P, then the term omega over P is, is less than 1. By the time you square something smaller than 1, this is really, really less than 1. This is, uh, this is basically 0. Wouldn't you agree? In this regime, this term evaluates to effectively 0. So this thing, I think, is safe to approximate as 0 here, right? If that's the case here, now i got to make this an approximate sign here, right? But this comes into negative 10 times log base 10 of 1, right? If you recall your log identities here, right, what is log base 10 of 1? That's uh, a big fat 0. So this whole thing goes to 0. So what's interesting here is that the magnitude plot, 20 log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega, right, is approximately zero as long as you're in the regime of omega is less than p, right, or smaller than p. So what we can do then here is let's come over to our, our, our plot over here, okay, and let's just pick some p value. I don't know, I'm going to draw a line here. Let's, let's say p is, a, uh, I don't know, like, uh, like here. I think, let's call this how about... P of, uh, I don't know, how about 0 0.3 or something like that, okay? So what we can do here is that as long as omega is less than this P value or somewhat far away from it, we see that the magnitude plot just stays at 0. Maybe I should label the y-axis here. Here's 0 dB, right? And then maybe let's, uh, yeah, maybe let's come up here. This is 20, and how about negative 20? Okay, something like that. So what we can say here is that, okay, this magnitude plot just looks like this. I'm going to do it in green. And I'm not going to go all the way up to the line because we see that as omega starts to get close to P, this approximation where we claim that this term is zero starts to break down here, right? So I'm going to stop right here. So this so far is a, uh, an approximation. So we see that if you have a system which is a just a single pole, at low frequencies, low being relative to your pole location here, the amplification is zero, right? Basically, you get the same sine wave out that you put in here, which again is, well, I'll tell you what, look, look, I'll, I'll leave the physical interpretation of this for, for a little bit more until we've had a little bit more discussion here, okay? Okay, so that's awesome. We got some intuition there. Let's do the same sort of analysis here for how about, um, uh, the, the angle, right? Because right now we looked at the magnitude, but we did not look at the angle here, right? So let's do the same analysis. Maybe let me grab an eraser here. And now let's analyze the case of the angle here. So the next part of this discussion here is I need angle of G of J omega, right? Which we said was tan inverse of minus omega over P. Right. So again, same thing here. Uh, let's examine this term here. Right. We said that if omega over p, if omega is less than p, this is basically zero here. Right. But I guess we should also make a note here that omega over p is approximately zero. 
um, versus omega over p squared is approximately zero is what we did earlier. What I'm trying to get at here is again, t maybe we should just write this out. So this is tan inverse of zero, right? And I probably should have put the approximate sign here, right? So in this regime here, uh, it's approximately equal to inverse tangent of zero. If you remember what that is here, right? Isn't this just zero? Uh, zero radians here. So here we end up with our approximation here. So we see there is no phase shift in this case. So coming over here to our plot, again, we can start here at zero, right? And then we're going to stop before we reach P. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop a little bit before I stopped earlier. The reason being here, exactly what I was trying to allude to earlier, this approximation will break down faster. As omega gets closer to P, this approximation is worse than omega over P squared, approximately equal to zero. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop it a little bit before I stopped the magnitude plot here. But again, what we see is that at low frequencies, there's no phase shift and there's also no magnification here. All right. Okay, great. So that's pretty good. Let's keep going now. Let's go and look at how about case B now. Okay. So case B here is I want to look at the situation where I'm sitting at the break frequency, right? And this is when omega was equal to P. What happens there, okay? So again, let's do our same analysis. What I want to look at here is I just want to understand what this function looks like at that condition here, right? So I want 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of G of J omega is minus 10 times log base 10 of one plus. Now I'm interested in the case where omega is equal to P. So this is P over P squared, right? So look at this, you end up with minus 10 log base 10 of two, <laughs> right? Okay, that's actually interesting because you can actually directly evaluate that here. And we end up with, this is just, um, Basically, if you numerically work this out, it's minus 3.013, okay? So again, this is units of decibels here. So the magnitude plot at, the, at omega is equal to P is exactly equal to this. Notice there's no approximate signs here, right? We didn't make any approximations. This is still a pure equal sign here. So what I can do over here on my plot here is that I can put an exact point right here, right? And this point here, I know for a fact is minus 3.013 dB here, okay? This is actually kind of significant. Some people call this frequency omega equal to P. This is sometimes referred to as your, uh, also it could be your 3 dB frequency. You'll also hear, I called it earlier the break frequency. Some people also call this your corner frequency. It's basically when the frequency is equal to the pole value, there's all these different names for it. And we're gonna see why it's called these things in a second. But I just wanna bring up to your, your attention here that right here, this is an exact point. I know the Bode plot is gonna go through this point exactly. This is not an approximation here, right? Let's do the exact same thing for the phase angle here, right? So here, do the same tricks here and the same sort of analysis for the phase angle. So I want magnitude of G of J omega here at that condition, which is tan inverse of minus, I guess it's now P over P here, right? So this is tan inverse of uh, minus one here, right? So if you evaluate that, this is what? This is, uh, I think it's pi over four, or I guess, or sorry, negative pi over four. I gotta make sure I, get, I, I keep taking this into account, right? Or this is minus 45 degrees. Right? So again, pure equal sign, right? This is not an approximation here. So I can come over here to our plot and I can put in a exact point. Where did I, ah, oh, here we go. Let me go here. How about this is minus pi over four and this is minus pi over two, right? So I have one exact point of my phase plot right here. Great. Okay, so we're getting there. Let's keep going now. Let's do our case C. Okay, case C was this last one. It's the high frequency situation. 
So meaning your, our omega is much greater than P here. So again, let's do our, our, our analysis. I think you're getting the pattern here, right? I will still want the magnitude of the system in decibels here. So it is now minus 10 times log base 10 of one plus omega over P squared, right? So now, let's again make a little note here that if omega is greater than p here, wouldn't you agree that this omega over p squared term dominates this? This one really doesn't matter here, right? So if this is the case, we can basically say one plus omega over p squared is approximately omega over p squared, right? The one does nothing here, right? So now let's go and add our approximate symbol here. So I get minus 10 times log base 10 of uh, basically what? It's omega over p squared, right? Okay, let's do our, another, our falling off the log trick here. So this is now the, the squared will come down here and this becomes minus 20 times log base 10 of omega over p, right? Okay, now let's go ahead and recall, you remember how multiplication and, and quotients worked with logs here? So if you had a log base anything, log base b of like an x over y. This is equal to log base b of what? Of x minus log base b of y, right? So let's just apply this log identity here and we end up with minus 20 times the quantity log base 10 of omega minus log base 10 of p, right? Let's, let's distribute the minus 20 through here. So you could write this thing as minus 20 times log base 10 of omega minus, or sorry, plus, I guess, 20 log base 10 of P, right? Okay, um, if you look at this, here we go. Take a look at this. What is the right hand or the left hand side of this? This is the Y value here of my magnitude plot, right? So this is basically Y is equal to, this is almost like a slope, right? Let's call this like a slope M, right? So let me, let me do it in green here, right? M, what is this term right here? Log base 10 of omega here, right? If you come over to our Bode plot, remember we're plotting omega in log base 10 uh, scale, right? It's a semi-log scale. So this thing in green here, this is basically the X value of the plot here, right? So this is like an X, right? Plus, this thing right here, this is like a constant, wouldn't you agree? 20 times log base 10 of P, like P is a known value. In this case, it's 0 0.3. So if you look at this thing long enough, right? This sure looks like a Y is equal to MX plus B here, right? So it's basically telling us that the magnitude plot is basically a straight line here with a slope of minus 20 here, right? So if I wanna come over here to my magnitude plot, what I can draw this thing like is that it's, it's something like this. It's, um, how am I gonna draw this? Uh, something like this. It's a straight line here. So this line here has a slope in our case, let me write this down here, of minus 20 here. And if you look at the units here, it's rise over run. So the rise is in decibels, right? And the run is, it's not a linear scale. These are decades here. So a lot of times you'll hear people refer to this as, this is a line with a slope of minus 20 decibels per decade here, right? Which is what we've got written down here, right? Y is equal to MX plus B here, right? So here you go. This is, this is actually pretty helpful here. Um, let, let's, let's do one more. Let, let's finish our discussion on the phase and then we'll maybe sketch this all out here. So, uh, okay, let's, let's erase this and let's do our phase analysis here, okay? Great, because we're almost there. This is getting really exciting here. We're really cooking with fire now, okay? So the phase here, right? In case C, I'm still looking for angle of G of J omega, right? Which we said was tan inverse of minus omega over P here, right? And now, again, uh, we're gonna make a note here that if omega is greater than P here, right? Basically, let's call this omega over P term to be basically infinite, right? Or, or large, right? This term is going to be big, 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 right? So we end up with, this is basically tan inverse of minus infinity. Oh, no, sorry, whoops, this needs to be an approximate symbol, right? Right? So again, you evaluate this out and you end up with, this is minus pi over two, right? 
or 90 degrees, right? So here we are. The phase at high frequency should basically be minus 90. So what we end up with here is something like this here. I want to make sure I line this up. Right? So the green here are all of my approximations of this system. So uh, what we can do now is you can kind of connect the dots here, right? So let's look at the magnitude one. We see that, okay, the way that we're going to sketch this here is you're going to start from zero and you're going to go along and it's going to be at zero until you reach the break frequency here or this corner frequency. And then the magnitude plot is just going to start coming down. And I guess I wish, I wish this lined up a little better, but there we go. Something like this here, right? So the green is our approximation. Right? Similarly, for the phase here, what you can do is same thing. You're going to come along here, and then you're going to stop well before P, and then it's going to go down. It's going to go through this 45 degree point, and then it's going to keep going down all the way to minus 90 here. Right? Okay, so with this, we can write a couple of rules of how to approximate the Bode plot for a pull, uh, for a single real pole here, right? So let me erase some of these. And we'll come up with our, our sort of rules for sketching a, a uh, single pole here. So um, let's write this down. We're going to call this approximation. Or how about the approximate plot for a single real pole. Right? Okay. So for the magnitude, Right, remember, this is in decibels, so maybe let's, let's underline this. So here's the rule of thumb here of how to sketch the magnitude in decibels of a single pole here, a single real pole here, right? So what you're going to do here is you're going to remain at 0 dB, right, until the break frequency. Um, which was, again, omega is equal to P, right? Okay, and then linearly decrease with slope of minus 20 decibels per decade, right? So now you can kind of see why this, this frequency omega p gets the term of break frequency, break slash corner, um, slash uh, 3 dB frequency because this is where the magnitude plot starts breaking down or takes a corner turn and starts dropping here. So you start getting attenuation at frequencies above the 3 dB frequency or the corner frequency. One thing we will maybe note here is take a look here that the approximation that we made in green Notice that it doesn't go through this green point that we talked about earlier here. So we know here that there's a discrepancy. And we're willing to pay that price here because it's so easy to sketch this thing with this simple rule of just stay at zero until you reach the break frequency and then go down at 20 decibels per decade here, right? In a second, we're going to look at the real system and overlay it with our approximation and see what kind of um, errors we introduce. But we know for a fact that at this corner frequency, there's going to be a 3.013 decibel error, so to speak here. Okay. But again, we're, we're willing to deal with that here. Okay. So that's how you sketch the magnitude plot here. How about the phase plot? Right. The phase is very similar here, right? So what you're going to do here is again, you remain at zero uh, degrees slash radians, right? Whatever here, however, what unit you want here um, until approximately uh, approximately one decade before uh, your break frequency. Okay, uh, and then what you're going to do here is is then linearly decrease Um, all the way to minus pi over 2, or minus 90 degrees, which occurs at one decade above your break frequency. Okay? Maybe we'll make a note here that this will go through 
through the uh, minus 45 degrees, or I guess the pi over 4 point at omega is equal to your break frequency here, right? Which is what we drew over here, right? So you see that we stay at zero until one decade, a whole decade before P, then we start dropping down to, to end up at minus 90 degrees or minus pi over two radians, one decade above P. And doing so, we actually go straight through the 45 degree point, which we showed had to be a location on your Bode plot here. So again, there's no, you, you don't miss here, at the um, at the break frequency in the phase, like we miss up here in the in the magnitude. So, um, that being said, here, what I think we should maybe do now is, now that we understand how to sketch these, let's run over to MATLAB and compare uh, the actual brute force method way of computing the Bode plots versus the uh, the hand sketch, and we'll see if they line up or not. All right, so here we are over in MATLAB. So let's go ahead and use MATLAB to draw exact Bode plots of individual components, right? So we'll go clear CLC, close all, and let's just do our first case, which was a single real pole, right? So we said that's pretty easy. Let's pick a pole location. I think we did P of 0 0.3 earlier. So the numerator is just going to be a one, right? And the denominator is gonna be a one over P and a one, right? So now here's our transfer function. And now let's go ahead and just make a Bode plot of that here using the Bode command here. And I'm going to turn the grid on and I'll add a title of this here. This is a single real pole. Right, so let's just go ahead and run this now to get our Bode plot. And here it is. And you can see that it looks pretty reasonable here. So tell you what, actually, I've already got this in PowerPoint. I moved it over to PowerPoint so we could overlay some of our sketches. So this is the exact same plot here. And you can see the blue is our exact solution to the Bode plot. That's what it, it should look like. But we talked about now, we understand how to sketch this and get an approximation of this Bode plot without needing to brute force this thing in MATLAB. So the first thing we did here was we identified where the pole location or where that break frequency was. So in our case, it's a P of 0 0.3 here. And then what might be helpful here is let's draw a line here one decade before P and one decade after P as well. And we saw that to draw the magnitude plot, the first thing you do here is you start at low frequencies and you just stay at zero. So that's the green line we just added up there on the magnitude plot. It's zero. And then when you reach the break frequency of P, you just start descending or linearly going down on the Bode plot with a slope of minus 20 decibels per decade here. And you can see right here, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but I'm trying to just show again, here's the discrepancy. The major error here actually occurs at the break frequency where we have the most most difference between our green approximation and the blue exact solution here. But overall, that's pretty good here. I think the green line approximates the blue line quite well here. Okay, the next thing to do here, let's talk about the phase here. So again, the phase we said, the way you draw that is you start at zero de uh, degrees phase shift, and it stays at zero until one decade before the uh, break frequency, and then it just starts going down linearly to minus 90 degrees which occurs one decade after the break frequency. And again, notice here, uh, and sorry, I guess maybe we should finish this out. And then at higher frequencies, right, it just stays at um, minus 90 degrees here. And again, notice that at the break frequency, we actually nail the phase plot exactly. And we actually have just some error before and after um, the, the corner frequency. So overall, I think this seems pretty reasonable. This seems like a very good way to sketch a single real pull Bode plot. Okay, so let's do this. Let's jump back to the board and see, does this situation change if we have a single real zero? Okay, so let's repeat this analysis for our second component, which was a single real zero, right? So in this case, the transfer function that we're interested in is, again, writing this in standard Bode plot format here is S over Z plus one. And a couple of things, again, to note about this here is that it has a DC gain of one and it has a zero at s is equal to minus z, right? So z is the location of this zero, okay? So to get the frequency response like we did earlier, we just need to go ahead and compute first g of j omega here, right? Which is basically j omega over z plus one here, or you could rewrite this quite easily as a real part plus an imaginary part, where 
Alpha is actually really easy to deal with here. That's just one here, you can see. And then your beta is just what? It's just omega over z here, right? So, uh, okay. That was uh, that. So now we need to go ahead and just compute magnitude of g of j omega, right? Which was, again, same thing we did earlier. Square root of alpha squared plus beta squared here. So again, you plug all this in, you get an expression here, and we'll end up getting this to look like, uh, it's interesting, it's 1 plus quantity omega over z squared to the 1 half, right? So here's magnitude here, and then same thing, let's do the same thing for the angle of g of j omega, right? Which was, again, going to simply be um, tan inverse of beta over alpha, right? Where you manipulate this enough and you get this thing to be tan inverse of omega over z here, right? Just plug in your alpha beta values and everything works out nicely. So again, maybe let's put this up here and box it up in the corner because what we're going to want to understand is what do these expressions look like as omega changes relative to z. And again, we probably should make this uh, the magnitude in decibels here, right? So what we want here is we want 20 times log base 10 of the magnitude of g of j omega. And what you end up with here is after doing your manipulations, just like we did last time here, you basically take 20 times log base 10 of this, the half falls off and all this kind of good stuff, you end up with 10 times log base 10 of one plus omega over z squared. Okay, so that's the first one. And then angle of g of j omega is just the thing we had earlier, which was inverse tangent of omega over z. Okay, so great. Let's box this up, keep this in the upper left corner of the board here, because now what we're going to do is again consider our three cases of what does this look like um, at the the three different scenarios of low frequencies, at the corner frequencies, and at the uh, uh, at high frequencies. Before we do that here, maybe a quick thing to note here, um, slash maybe compare. Let's compare this with what we had for our single real pole here. So in our case, if you remember here, for our single pole here, when we looked at 20 log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega, this was for our single real pole here, right? We said this was minus 10 times log base 10 of one plus omega over p squared, right? And then the angle of g of j omega was, uh, what was this? This was, um, yeah, inverse tangent of minus omega over p here, right? So these here were for the single real pole. And what we just derived up here was for the single real zero. And I just wanted to put both of these next to each other because if you notice, they're incredibly similar here, right? There's a sign change here for the magnitude and also a sign change in the, in the input argument to the inverse tangent here for the, for the phase. So the plot is actually going to turn out to look very, very similar here. There's just minor differences here, right? So with that being said, let's consider our three cases here. So again, case A here, right, was small frequencies. Right? Namely, omega is much, much less than the zero location z. Okay? So this is the exact same analysis we did earlier, and pretty much everything will apply, all the same logic, because you see the expressions are virtually identical here, right? So what we end up with here is that at small frequencies, I'm just going to skip all the steps because I don't need to re repeat myself. Just feel free to back up the video and look at how we analyze the single real pole. It's basically the same thing here. So in our case with a single pole, a uh, single zero, 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega, Right? This approximates to come out to basically zero here, the same thing we had earlier. And finally, the angle of g of j omega, if you follow that exact same logic, also comes out to be zero. Okay, So we can make the exact same plot we did last time here. Um, in this case, maybe let's pick a p-value. Uh, for giggles, let's try something different. How about, how about a p over here? Maybe a z equals 2 here, so maybe something like, like this. Make a red line here. Here's z is equal to two radians per second, okay? So in this case, same thing. It stays at zero 
the magnitude stays at zero until you get to the pole or to the zero location. And similarly, maybe we should draw a line one decade before the Z value. Let's here's, this is like 0.1 Z. So that's one decade before. And let's draw another line one decade after. All right, so here's 10 times Z, okay? And what we see here is, again, we'll make the exact same argument we did when we were analyzing the, the, the pole. And we'll just make this thing, the green line, which is our approximation, start at, uh, stay at zero until you get one decade before the zero location, right? Because that's what we end up with with our approximation. Okay, let's keep going here. So how about case B here, right? Case B was look at, at the corner slash break frequency which was when omega is equal to z here, right? So you follow the exact same logic here. Um, you, you know, tell you what, let, let's do it maybe for, for the uh, magnitude just so we're all on the same page, right? So it's 10 times log base 10 of one plus z over z squared here, right? So this thing comes out to basically positive 3.013, okay? And then similarly for the phase here, magnitude of g of j omega, when omega is equal to z is basically tan inverse of what? It's z over z, which was tan inverse of one here, which is what? This is uh, pi over four, right? Or 45 degrees, however you like to think about it. So again, we can draw this over here. Our magnitude here at the break frequency is exactly here at a value of positive three. 0.013 decibels and our phase here is at uh oh crud now i, I guess i should have shifted this whole thing down <laughs> tell you what we're gonna have to we're gonna have to make this go up because now we end up with positive 45 so i need positive pi over four and i need oh no tell you what i'm gonna erase this make this line go up a little more here's positive pi over two here okay so now we have a location here all right there great okay um all right let's keep going here now case c here c was was at high frequencies right when omega is much much greater than z here so again you go through the exact same logic here that we did with the pole here. The analysis is the exact same. And what you'll end up with here is, um, again, I don't think we need to roll through all the steps because it's virtually identical. There's just a small sign change here, but you can get this thing to look like, I better put the approximate sign in here. Approximate 20 times log base 10 of omega um, minus 20 times log base 10 of Z. Right? And then the angle of G of J omega is going to be, again, you see when omega is much, much bigger than Z, this basically becomes positive infinity. So this is basically tan inverse of positive infinity here, which is going to give you what? Pi over two, right? Or 90 degrees, however you like to think about it. So again, you get the exact same thing here, right? So here's your y at value that I'm plotting, this entire left side. This is y is equal to, here's your slope m, here's your x value that we're plotting on the, on the magnitude plot here, and then here's your offset b here. So the slope in this case is positive 20 decibels per decade here, right? So this approximation looks like this, and then it starts to go up at 20 decibels per decade. This is positive 20 dB per decade, all right? Um, and then our phase we said here at high values is over here now, right? Okay. And now all we need to do is, again, just connect the dots here to make... Oh, crud, that's not a very good line. <laughs> Whoops. Ah, uh, shoot. Let me get a, get a pen, uh, an eraser here. I'll try to make this a little bit better here. There. Something like this. 
So here you go. Here's your approximation here for a um, single real zero. And you notice here, what's fascinating about this is it is basically the mirror image. It's the, it's the reflected Bode plot of a single real zero, but reflected over the X axis here, right? So instead of breaking down like it did with a pole, the, the magnitude plot actually breaks up at positive 20 decibels per decade. And instead of losing 90 degrees of phase, you gain 90 degrees of phase as the frequency increases, right? So again, if you don't believe me, let's jump over to MATLAB and we will go ahead and plot the, uh, the exact solution versus our approximations. All right, so let's go ahead and do the second one using MATLAB, which was our single real zero, right? So I think we said a Z of, let's try something different. How about 2.0 for the break frequency? So in this case, the numerator is now what? It's one over Z and one, and the denominator is just one here. So our transfer function is a little bit different here, but I can still go ahead and go figure Bode G grid on, and this is now our single real zero, right? So let's just run this here and here it is. Here's our Bode plot of the zero. And actually, tell you what, let me drag over. Here's our Bode plot of the pole here. Maybe let's put these two next to each other so you can see that, yes, indeed, they look like mirror images, right? You got the pole over here, which comes at zero and then breaks down. And the zero stays at zero and breaks up. And again, the phases are also mirror images of them. So again, just to help illustrate this and overlay our approximations, I moved that plot over to PowerPoint. So here's that same um, uh, plot here showing the exact in blue and again the way that we would draw an approximation of a single real zero is first go ahead and identify where the break frequency is and also identify one decade before and one decade after and then all the magnitude plot does in decibels is it stays at zero until you reach the break frequency and then it breaks up at a slope of positive 20 decibels per decade. The phase stays at zero degrees until you hit one decade before the break frequency and then increases to positive 90 degrees one decade after, whereas after that it stays at positive 90 degrees. So again, you can see the difference between the green and the blue arrow uh, lines are fairly reasonable and all the same analysis applies between the pole and the zero here. Again, you get this discrepancy of positive uh, three decibels between the approximation and the real thing, but I think it's a small price to pay for the quick and easy easy understanding of how a pole and how a zero affect the Bode plot of a, uh, a system. Okay, so let's jump over to the board again and look at item number three, which was our pole at the origin. Okay, so rolling right along here, the third component that we wanted to look at was a pole at the origin, right? So in other words, we were considering a transfer function that looked like this, right? One over S. So uh, let's do our same thing like we've been doing for the last two. Let's go ahead and get the frequency response by basically looking at G of J omega here. So that's one over J omega here, which is really simple here to write as a real plus imaginary here, right? Because you can see that alpha is just zero here and beta is just one over omega here, right? So the magnitude of G of J omega Right, it's just square root of alpha squared plus beta squared here. So just plugging this in, this is actually really pretty darn simple here. We end up with just, uh, what do we end up with here? This is just one over omega, right? By the time you do all the algebra and plug all that in, it's just one over omega. And again, getting this in decibels of 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of G of J omega, right? It's just 20 times log base 10 of uh, one over omega, right? Which I guess you could write this as 20 times log base 10 of omega to the minus one here, right? And then do the falling off the log thing. So this is now negative 20 times log base 10 of omega, right? And this is interesting here because again, if we look at this, right? This is what I want to plot on the y-axis, and here, this is our x value, and there's no offset. So interestingly here, this is actually dead simple to, uh, to draw on our Bode plot. And notice, there's no approximation here. This is an equal sign. So really, this looks like just y is equal to some slope m times, here's the x value, 
right? So the way you draw this on the Bode plot here is um, you make we, we can make a note here that at omega is equal to one here, right? So maybe just make a quick note here. So note at omega is equal to one here, right? What what does this look like? This is minus twenty times log base ten of one here, right? So this is basically zero here. So at a frequency of one, this goes through zero. So I can draw a line, a dot right here, right? And all this thing does here is it goes up at a, uh, no, sorry, 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 it goes down. I gotta make sure I get this right. It's a minus sign here, right? Minus 20 decibels. So it goes like this, right? Like this. And it just goes like this. Ah. Forever. <laughs> right? And I'll just keep extending this here. The slope here is negative 20 decibels per decade. So there's no approximation with the pole at the origin. It just, it's a straight line which happens to go through the point one zero on the magnitude chart here, right? We can do a similar analysis for the phase angle here, right? So for phase, right, you get angle of G of J omega, right? Which is really simple, right? This is now tan inverse of the um, imaginary over the real component here. So this is what? It's uh, the imaginary was uh, one over omega all over zero. So this is basically tan inverse of positive infinity here, right? Wait a second. No, did I, where did I drop the minus sign? Where did I drop something? Hold on, it should be, did I drop the minus sign he here? Where's my beta, where was beta? Sorry guys, uh, sorry, but sorry, I dropped it right here. Shoot, 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 this should have been a negative. Wait, wait a second, wait, now we gotta back up even further. Did I really get that? Yeah, sorry, sorry, I did skip. I, I I skipped some steps here when I went dot, 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 skipping from here to here, right? Because you got to multiply by the complex conjugate. Yeah, so that will get you a negative sign here. Anyway, if you want to check it, just make sure that this is right. But there should be a negative sign here. But that's why this didn't matter because you squared it here. So so our, our expression for magnitude was still correct here, right? But the phase here, this should be negative there. Right, which makes this tangent inverse of negative infinity here, which gives us the result that we're looking for. The angle of G of J omega here is minus 90 here, right? 90 degrees or I guess minus pi over two, right? And again, notice there's no approximation sign. It's an equal sign right here, right? So to sketch it or to actually completely accurately draw this thing, right? What we end up with here is just this forever right so it's really simple here to draw the Bode plot for a pole at the origin maybe let's just write this down here the rules and then we'll take a quick note here and maybe uh, think about this but the rules here for drawing the Bode plot for a single pole at the origin here is for the magnitude in decibels, right? The way you do that here, it's really simple, right? It's just a line with slope of minus 20 decibels per decade that goes through uh, the point um, zero dB at omega is equal to one rad per second, right? So that's that green line here, right? And the phase is even easier, right? It's just a constant phase of minus pi over two or minus 90 degrees for all omega here, right? So um, yeah, that's kind of interesting here. So the Bode plot, I actually, we don't even need to go to MATLAB because this is not an approximation. That is an exact solution here. And the reason why is if you think about this long enough here, right? Consider our transfer function. We said this was one over S here, right? You have an input U and you have an output Y here, right? What's another name for the transfer function of one over S? Isn't this an integrator? Right, if you remember our discussion on Laplace transforms here, we know that a one over S is a pure integral here. So in other words, the output Y of T 
right? It's just the integral of the input, right? Now, with our frequency domain analysis, what kind of inputs are we putting in here? We're putting in an A sine omega t, right? So here, we can say, all right, what is the integral of A sine omega t, right? Well, let's pull this out. The A comes over here, so it's A times integral of sine omega t. Whoops, I guess I lost my dt, right? You guys all remember how to do an integral of a sine, right? This comes out to, uh, I think it's minus cosine omega t all over omega here, right? That's the integral times a, right? So at the end of the day here, what we end up with here is y of t is actually minus a over omega cosine of omega t, right? So this is what comes out here. You put in a pure sine wave, what do you get out? You again, you get a pure cosine wave out. And notice that there's no steady state value, right? This is the actual, there's no transient, right? You put in a, a, cos, a sine wave, you instantly get out a sine wave. There's no transients that have to die away or anything like that. So look at this. You put in a sine wave of magnitude A, you get out a sine wave of magnitude A over omega here, right? So the cosine wave starts shrinking as omega increases. Isn't that exactly what this Bode plot is telling you, right? As omega increases, the output just starts going down and down and down and down. Well, I guess, I guess uh, as long as omega is greater than one, <laughs> right? If omega is less than one, the output, the, the cosine wave gets bigger here. So again, this makes perfectly good physical sense here, right? Furthermore, let's think about the phase shift here, right? You put in a sine wave, you actually get out a negative cosine wave of the exact same frequency, right? What's the difference between a sine wave and a negative cosine wave? If you plot the two on top of each other, they're just out of phase by 90 degrees here, right? So again, this is really interesting because the Bode plot is telling us exactly what you could get here from just analysis of uh, this specific transfer function here, right? So there you go. This is how you can do this for a pole at the origin. Why don't I go ahead and erase the board? Let's do this for a zero at the origin and see if there are some similar parallels. Okay, so on to component number four, which is a pure zero at the origin. Okay, so again, our transfer function now is just g of s is equal to s. So the magnitude, or sorry, <laughs> g of j omega, right, is actually really easy, right? It's just j omega. Or if you want to write this as a real plus an imaginary component here, you can basically see that alpha is just zero here, right? And beta is just omega here, right? So the magnitude of g of j omega, right, which is our amplification here. It's, uh, wow, that's super simple here, right? It's just square root of alpha squared plus beta squared, which is square root of zero squared plus omega squared. So this is actually super easy, right? It's just omega here. So magnitude of g of j omega is just omega. And again, for our Bode plot, we really want 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega. So it's just 20 times log base 10 of omega, right? And now, again, we can make the exact same uh, logic that we saw earlier in the sense that, well, the left side here, right, this is just the y value on my Bode plot is equal to some slope m times here is the x value, right? Log base 10 of omega here. So we see that again, what you end up with here is a line that goes through the point um, omega when omega is one, this evaluates to zero here. So we basically have a single point that we can say, this is the exact same po point we saw with the differentiator here. And now all that happens is it's a slope of positive 20 decibels per decade here, right? So we, we get this, whoops, crud, that doesn't look like a very good line. I am. I'm horrible at drawing straight freehand lines, but there you go. You get this thing with a slope of positive 20 decibels per decade here. And again, it just goes on forever in either direction here, right? And again, there's no approximation here, right? Notice this, it's a pure equal sign. So we don't have to make any approximations for uh, this zero at the origin. Similarly, let's keep going here with our, how about angle of G of J omega, right? That was the other half of the Bode plot we need here. So that's really easy. So this is just tan inverse of um, beta over alpha here, or tan inverse of what was beta? Beta was the, 
omega and alpha was zero here. So this is tan inverse of positive infinity here, right? So we basically get a constant here of just pi over two or 90 degrees, right? So again, coming back to our Bode plot, this is actually now just a constant value here that goes on forever in either directions at positive 90 degrees. And again, the nice thing about the zero at the origin is it's not an approximation, right? It's a equality sign here. So this is the exact Bode plot. And again, let's just take one more step back and think about does this make physical sense if we understand what does this transfer function look like, right? Or what, or what does it do? What is it actually trying to physically represent, right? So again, I like to graphically draw this out in sort of block diagram fashion, right? So you've got your g of s, which is just s here. And hopefully, again, uh, our knowledge of Laplace transforms, we know that s in the Laplace domain is basically a derivative in the, in the time domain. So this is basically a differentiator. Basically, what this transfer function does is anything you put in, it just takes its pure derivative here. So the input that we put in, again, with our frequency domain analysis, it's a sine omega t here, right? So the output here the relationship is that the output is just the derivative of the input with respect to time here right so the input was a sine omega t right that's what the transfer function does and that's how it computes the output given the input here right this was our u of t right so again you take its derivative and what do we end up with this is just a omega cosine omega t right so here coming out as a omega cosine omega t, right? So you put in a sine wave of magnitude a, you get out a cosine wave of magnitude a times omega, which is exactly what you see here in the Bode plot here, right? As omega increases um, beyond one, this thing just starts increasing and amplifying the input signal a here, right? And if, if omega is less than one here, right, it just starts attenuating here. Perfect. And again, if you look at this, what's the difference between a sine and a cosine wave? Well, the cosine is just shifted, a sine wave shifted by positive 90 degrees, right? And that shift is independent of frequency. So again, this all checks out here. Um, it makes perfectly good sense. Okay, so uh, good. We did a, a real pole, we did a real zero, and we saw that in that situation, the two things were flipped mirror images of each other across the x-axis. We did then a pole at the origin and a zero at the origin, and we saw that, again, these were flipped over the y-axis. So now, uh, we've kind of made it to the main event of the evening here. Let's erase the board and we'll go on to number five, which is our pair of complex conjugate poles. All right, so now we get to the fifth component, which is where it gets interesting. So this is now considering the Bode plot for a pair of complex conjugate poles. Okay. Um, okay, so again, the transfer function that goes along with this here is, let's write our standard second order transfer function, right? Omega n squared all over s squared plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n squared here. And actually, I'm just gonna rewrite this by um, uh, pulling out the omega n and canceling it. So in other words, uh, an, an alternate representation of this that's gonna be a little bit more helpful is uh, one over, 1 over omega n squared s squared plus 2 zeta all over omega n s plus 1 here, okay? So again, those are just mathematically equivalent here. Um, let's consider the transfer function in this format here, okay? So again, a couple of things to note here about the transfer function here. So this thing has a DC gain, again, of one here. And I keep stressing that because it's gonna make it an importance uh, a little bit later when we start composing these together, but maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I just wanted to illustrate why I keep mentioning about the DC gain here. Um, and also, where are the poles of this thing here? So this thing has a pair of poles at S is equal to, again, you just solve this denominator here for equal to zero here, or hopefully you've seen this enough that you know what the roots of a standard second order transfer function are here. And you would get this thing has poles at S is equal to minus zeta omega n plus or minus square root of uh, one minus, uh, oh, sorry, t t plus or minus omega n times square root of one minus zeta squared, okay? 
All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the same thing that we've been doing for the past four components here. So let's get the frequency response of the system here. So in other words, we're gonna calculate G of J omega. <laughs> and what I'm gonna do right now, as you can see, again, it, the, the concept is simple. It's the same concept we've been doing before. It's basically take this transfer function everywhere you see an S, jam in J omega, and try to manipulate that to get it to the form of alpha plus beta J here, right? Just turn it into a complex number. Again, this transfer function, it doesn't matter how complicated it is, by the time you, you replace S with J omega, it's just a complex number. But you can see this is kind of ugly here, right? So I'm just gonna write down what we're gonna do or what the plan is and what the result is and then I'll prove it to you in Mathematica here in a second here uh, over there on the computer so what I claim here is you could get this thing to look like this here again you would get it to be a real part plus an imaginary part J here right now here's where this thing gets ugly here right so alpha here if you go ahead to Mathematica and compute what alpha and beta is alpha is gonna look like this it's uh, I'll just write it down once for completeness here so we're all on the same page here uh, okay so alpha is 1 over uh, quantity 1 minus omega squared over omega n squared plus 4 zeta squared omega squared all over omega n squared Okay, uh, oh wow, and sorry, and, and this term, sorry, this is actually squared. That, okay, this whole thing, minus omega squared all over, uh, we've got a couple of braces here. This is now one minus omega squared over omega n squared, this squared plus four zeta squared omega squared over omega n squared. This thing, and then I need a parenthesis to close that parenthesis, and this is whole multiplied by omega n squared. Yuck, all right? All right, and then beta is negative two zeta omega all over uh, 1 minus omega squared over omega n squared. This term is squared. Plus 4 zeta squared omega squared all over omega n squared. Close that. And then again, the whole denominator is multiplied by omega n. So again, they're, they're, they, they, they look similar, but they're not. So yuck. But here we go. Here's your alpha and beta here. And again, I'm going to run a mathematic in a second. We'll prove to you that I didn't just pull this out of thin air here. You can derive this by uh, doing the appropriate expansions and algebraic manipulations here. Okay. All right. So then um, actually, before we go over to Mathematica, let's do one more um, operation here. Basically, let's get the magnitude of this complex number here. Right. So let's go ahead and do magnitude of G of J omega. And I'm going to be very careful what I erase because I want to come here and now all right let's go ahead and get magnitude of g of j omega right which is just alpha squared plus beta squared to the one half here right so again <laughs> we're going to do this in Mathematica where you jam these things in right you do the manipulations and again I claim here that you can get this thing to look like at the end of the day here after all of the manipulations you're going to get this thing to look like this this is omega over omega n to the fourth plus two times two zeta squared minus one times the quantity omega all over omega n squared plus one to the minus one half. Yikes. Okay. All right. So that's the magnitude here. The last thing we want to do here is, uh, <laughs> I don't want the magnitude, right? I want the magnitude in dB, so I need to do 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of G of J omega, right? So I need a 20 log base 10, this entire ugly thing here, and again, I'll prove to you in Mathematica, but let's just write the results down after you do all of those manipulations here. You could get this thing to look like 20, uh, let me see, times log base 10 of the quantity uh wait a second sorry did i just oh no no sorry 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 <laughs> yeah this should actually be 
I'm looking at the wrong spot here in my notes here. Okay, so this is actually a minus 10 times log base 10 of the quantity omega all over omega n to the fourth plus two times two zeta squared minus one uh, times omega all over omega n squared plus one and the log. Great. Okay, so yeah, maybe we better box this up because this is the important part, right? This is the expression that gives us the actual solution here for the magnitude plot here on the Bode plot. And again, the, um, the, the angle here, right? The other half of this here, angle of G of J omega, right? It's just going to be our usual tan inverse, or maybe we should call it, you know, um, arc tangent or a tan two of beta alpha, right? Where this is again uh, a tan two of the y over x is what I'm denoting here, and you can see it's not going to simplify too much here. So we're just going to store it in this fashion here, where you just jam in this beta and that alpha here, and we'll keep it in that format. We're going to do a little bit of manipulation later. So again. Let me box up the two halves of what we want here. Here's the magnitude plot. Here is how we're storing the results for our phase plot here. But I made a lot of claims here. We better run over to Mathematica and show that this is actually true here. Um, and we'll, we'll come back in a second. So let me jump over to Mathematica. We'll do this boring derivation here. If you really don't care about that, feel free to skip out forward a few minutes until we're done with that Mathematica description. But I really think that um, in the interest of completeness, we better show that this is actually true and how you could derive this from first principles. All right, so the first thing we want to do is go ahead and define the transfer function, right? And we said this is the form that we wanted. So let's go ahead and define g of s here to be 1 over 1 over omega n squared s squared plus 2 zeta over omega n s plus 1 here, right? So that's our transfer function. Now here's where it got interesting. The next thing we wanted to do here was go ahead and evaluate g of j omega, right? This is where things started to get hairy, but in Mathematica, it's not that bad, right? I'm just going to plug in g of i omega here, and this is what we get. And I want to actually make this in real imaginary format here, so let's go ahead and do a complex expand on this. Whoops, come on, brackets. There we go, and there we are. Here's the real part, which we were calling alpha, and here's the imaginary part, which we were calling beta here. So let's go ahead and isolate the real and imaginary components if I can spell components correctly let's try that again here right and assign two variables alpha and beta respectively right so alpha is going to be just what we did earlier right it's going to be whoops complex expand of g of i omega Right, and actually, what I want here is I want the uh, the real part of that, right? Create, and then beta is going to be very similar, except beta is now the imaginary part of that. There we go. So here's my alpha, and here's my beta, right? Okay, so now we've got this thing in the form that we like, in the form of g of j omega whoops come on is equal to an alpha plus beta j right so what we can do now is go ahead and compute um the uh the magnitude right so now go ahead and calculate magnitude of g of j omega right so let's make a variable call it magnitude how about of g j omega here and that is just going to be well the magnitude of that complex number is just the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared square root right and yuck this thing gets a little bit ugly here let's go ahead and simplify this a little bit so let's say simplify here and let's tell it here that all the natural frequencies are going to be zero right so here we go so this is a slightly better form of uh g of j omega here or magnitude of g of j omega now if you remember here on the whiteboard 
we claimed that this could be written as um, this interesting format here. And I'm not going to try to punch it in. It's going to take me too long. I'll probably make too many mistakes. So I've gone ahead and prepared it off screen here. But this is basically what we had on the whiteboard here. So you know what? Let's go ahead and make another variable. Let's call it, how about magnitude gj omega, um, I don't know, whiteboard or something like that. And then plug this in. And again, to avoid me having a fat finger punch all that in here and screw something up, I've got it prepared off screen here. So here we go. Now all we got to do is check that this equals that, right? So in other words, we want to verify that the whiteboard result is the same as the Mathematica result, right? So in other words, I need to make sure that magnitude of G of J omega equals the magnitude of G of J omega whiteboard. Whoops, and I just noticed I spelled white wrong. There we go. Let's try that whiteboard. Okay, you check that and whoops, it didn't quite work because you know what we need to do? We need to simplify this entire expression. Try that again and still whoops, didn't work. But you know what? Let's t give it a couple of other restrictions and tell it that you know what? The natural frequency that we care about is all positive. The frequencies we're going to use are all positive and the damping ratio is all positive here. So if we do this now, now it's true. So great. We verify that this is a valid alternate expression for the magnitude of G of J omega, right? Okay, so the next thing that we need to do here is if you remember, uh, we don't actually want the magnitude of G of J omega. We want 20 times log base 10 of the magnitude of G of J omega here. So let's go ahead and verify that our, calc our, our whiteboard result of, what do we say on the whiteboard? On the whiteboard, I think we claimed here that, um, where is my expression? Here it is. Again, I had it prepared off screen here, right? This is what we said. It says when you take 20 times log base 10 of this ugly thing here, it would basically smash down to this, right? So again, let's go ahead and verify that. So I need to go ahead and check that 20 times log base 10, all right, of G of J omega here, which was uh, this thing, right? equals what we claim here of this negative 10 business here. And again, I don't want to punch all that in and get something wrong. So I got it prepared off screen here. So I'll just bring it in like that, right? So uh, again, let's, ch ooh, and I missed a brace there. There we go. Let's try that, right? And you shift enter that and nope, doesn't quite work here. So again, we're going to have to go ahead and try to simplify this entire check. Still didn't work. Let's add one more level of simplifications here. Let's go ahead and give it all of the results here saying that, you know what, all of the natural frequencies and damping ratios and frequencies we're interested are in all positive. Are they true under this regime? Give it another whirl here. Give it a second to think about it here. Still didn't work. You know what, instead of just plain old simplify, let's try full simplify. Throw some other additional simplification routines at this. Hit shift enter, let this think a little bit while, cross our fingers, and yay, hopefully, and it, check it out, it worked here. So, we're golden here. So, we showed that the whiteboard results are valid. In other words, the way that we can represent the actual Bode plot of the magnitude um, for a pair of complex poles is given by this expression here. And now this is the one we want to go ahead and examine a little more. So uh, let's jump back over to the whiteboard and do our same case where we look at three scenarios, one where there's low frequencies, one where the frequency is at the natural frequency, and one where the frequencies are high. All right, so here we are. We just verified that this result was valid here, right? This is the magnitude plot here. And again, the phase was a little bit interesting here. We just stored it here as our generic formula here for angle of a complex number and we're going to get to that in a second but now that we know that this is a valid expression we want to now go ahead and approximate this and do the same thing we did earlier and look at these three cases here so again case a here was uh small frequencies or low frequencies however you want to think about this right and we see that in this case right it's now we need to think about how is the frequency omega relative to the natural frequency omega n so th in the small case we want to look at what if omega is much less than omega n here right so in that case what does this expression up here look like so 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega 
right? Is now, let's think about this. We use all the exact same logic we did earlier, right? If omega is less than omega n here, right? This is small, definitely less than one. By the time you raise it to the fourth power, this is basically gone, right? Same thing with this thing right here. This is also gone. We're left with a basically a stupid one here, right? So this is minus 10 times log base 10 of one here, which again is basically is, is zero here, right? So we see that, again, we get the similar result here in the sense that once we pick a natural frequency, or again, let's, let's choose something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make something up here again. Uh, here, let's just put it someplace new again, just a different location as our other experiments here. But let's say omega n radians per second is right here, okay? So we see that uh, as long as your frequencies are less than omega n, you, the magnitude plot in terms of decibels is basically zero. So again, let's just draw this thing as a, as a flat line of zeros. Maybe I'm gonna stop a little bit closer here uh, before I exactly reach that, and we'll see a little bit why later. Okay, great, so that's the, the, the magnitude. How about the phase? What is the angle of G of J omega? Right? Well, we said it's this thing, right? It's a tan 2 of beta alpha. You know what? If you ignore the four quadrant uh, aspect of it, let's just think about this as a one quadrant. So inverse tangent of beta over alpha, right? You stick in the ugly beta and you stick in the ugly alpha that we derived earlier here, and this actually smashes down to something halfway darn reasonable. You end up with tan inverse of 2 zeta omega omega n all over omega squared minus omega n squared, right? And again, still an equal sign. I haven't made any approximations yet. But now let's go ahead and approximate and make a note here that if omega um, is, is less than omega n, I think it's a reasonable to say here that the product of omega times omega n is, is about zero, right? Because this is much, much smaller than this. You take a small thing, multiply by a reasonable thing, you get a small thing. So. We can approximate this. Let me put in the approximate sign here, right? As now tan inverse of basically zero, right? So we end up with, all right, at low frequencies, uh, whoops, again, I gotta make sure this is an approximate sign here. You basically get zero radians or zero degrees here. And again, this assumption breaks down a lot faster than these assumptions here. So we can still draw this thing as starting here at zero, but, but what I better do is, just like we did earlier, let's stop a decade away from omega n. So maybe let's draw ourselves another line here for, this is 0 0.1 times omega n, and let's do one decade above. So that would be over here, right here. So here's 10 times omega n. Great, okay, so we're gonna approximate the phase as being zero here at small, free, low frequencies, right? Okay, great. Let's keep rolling. Let's go over to case B here. So case B was uh, where, what happens if omega is equal to omega n here, right? So this is now, I guess you can still think of this as a corner or a break frequency here, but let's just say at, how about natural frequency? Right, so omega is equal to omega n, right? What happens there? Well, all right, if you do that, um, again, our 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of G of J omega, right, is basically this expression up here, right? It's minus 10 times log 10 of, this becomes uh, 1 to the fourth power, plus 2 times 2 zeta squared minus 1 times 1 squared plus 1, right? Okay, so uh, you do a little bit more algebra here, and this basically will be boiled down to, I'm gonna put the dot, dot, dot for the algebraic manipulations because I wanna skip that boring stuff, and it's not too hard to see, that you'll end up here with minus 10 times log base 10 of uh, two zeta, this whole quantity squared, right? And again, you can do the falling off the log thing here, so we end up with our final expression here of minus 20 times log base 10 of 2 zeta. Okay? So this is um, what? 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of G of J. I, I guess I should have said omega n here, right? Because it's, it's at the natural frequency here, right? Is equal to this value here. So what's interesting about this here 
is that the magnitude at the natural frequency actually depends on the damping ratio here, right? So one thing we should think about here is we should ask, how does this vary with, with damping ratio here? And more importantly, we should ask what values of damping ratio make sense here, right? So let's make a quick side note, right? We only care about zeta, which is actually in the range of zero to one. Here, right the reason why we don't care about anything else right if zeta was negative here right you have an unstable system here right and that's not what we're interested in analyzing because heck if the system is unstable you put in any kind of sinusoidal input the thing's just going to blow up so all of these results don't make any sense now if zeta was one or greater what does that mean you actually have an overdamp situation in that case you have an overdamp system and an overdamp system is the same thing as having real poles, right? Poles on the real axis, which is what we covered here as component number one here, right? When we looked at a single real pole here, right? So the only time that this analysis makes sense here is if zeta is in the range of zero to one here, right? So what we should do here is um, let's actually go ahead and uh, make a couple of interesting observations here. So we can note here that 20 times log base 10 of uh, 2 zeta, and actually, whoops, I forgot the minus sign here, right? Let's just take a look at this thing. So this is going to equal like a whole bunch of different values depending on zeta here. So here's the, the valuation here of the value. Or maybe we should put zeta in the first column here, right? And then this whole thing of negative 20 times log base 10 of 2 zeta in the second column here. So at the extreme values here, if it was zero, if damping ratio was zero here, you plug this in, you actually get infinity here, right? And again, we don't care about that case because it's actually kind of, uh, we care about this thing uh, non-exclusive zero, but I just want to bookmark this on two ends. The other end here that we really didn't care about was one here, right? And if you have a damping ratio of one, this whole thing evaluates to, uh, well, Two, negative 20 times log base 10 of 2 times 1. Numerically, you'll end up with negative 6.0206 decibels, right? Now, what's interesting here is the values that go in between here, right? So for example, here for a zeta of 0 0.1, you run these numbers here and you'll end up here with, uh, I think, 13.98 decibels. Zeta of 0 0.2, you would end up with 7.96. 0 0.3, you'd end up with uh, 4.43. Uh, let's keep going here, maybe halfway in between, 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is interesting, you'd actually end up with 0. Okay, and then you keep going here, you go up to like, I don't know, let's pick 0 0.9 here. 0 0.9 here, and you'd end up with minus 4, oh no, sorry, minus 5. Minus 5.11 decibels. So what's interesting here is the point on our Bode plot here on the magnitude part where omega is equal to omega n, it depends on the value of zeta here. So the only time you would come here at zero here is right here. So this point here is good for zeta is equal to 0 0.5. As your damping ratio goes down, notice that this value goes up, right? So you get a point here, you get a point here, you get a point here, et cetera, et cetera. Oops, and I guess, I guess to keep this consistent, it never goes up to 20, right? The biggest, I mean, you'd have to be pretty, yeah, you'd have to be less than 0.1. So tell you what, let's, let's maybe, let's do it like this. And maybe I'll go ahead and make this line here. Let's, let's claim this value is, is 13.98 here or something. Doesn't look exactly accurate here, but I think you get the picture, right? So this here is if you have a zeta of equal to 0 0.1, right? Similarly, as your damping ratio goes up, this value actually becomes negative here. So you could get all the way down here to say like negative 5.11 here, right? And this point here occurs when zeta is equal to 0 0.9, right? So interesting, right? This is what, what happens. Um, similarly, let's go on and uh, look at the phase here, right? Uh, okay, so maybe what we can do here is we can, we can erase this table here because I think we just looked at the magnitude here at the natural frequency. So let's also look here, how about at the phase? Okay, so I'll erase this. 
and let's go and look at the expression for angle of g of j omega, right? Um, okay, so uh, what we would end up with here is, uh, do, 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 do. Um, where did I end up with this? Did I put this down here in the notes? Yeah, okay, so this was tan inverse of um, beta over alpha. So again, ignoring the uh, ignoring the four quadrant aspect and looking at just the two quadrant one here, right? And now what's interesting here is what do beta and alpha come out to when omega is equal to omega n here, right? So if you remember um, our alpha term, well, I guess, yeah, I, I had that earlier and it was an ugly expression here. Uh, I wish I had this easy to pull up here. Oh, yeah, okay. Tell you what, it's an ugly expression, right? These are the two big things we derived at the beginning when we were looking at this. And we can go over to Mathematica, but long story short, you plug these two in and you basically go ahead and replace omega with omega n. And these two terms actually come out to be very interesting. So beta will actually turn out to be, uh, I believe it's, it's some number here, right? It's minus one over two zeta, right? The whole beta term turns into that, but the alpha term turns into a big fat zero here, right? So what we end up with here, this is basically tan inverse here of negative infinity here, right? So interestingly here, we end up with, this is minus pi over two or minus 90 degrees here, right? So angle of G of J, again, I screwed this up. This should be J at omega N, right? We're looking at when omega is equal to omega N. So here, you end up with a result here that the phase at the natural frequency is always minus 90 degrees. It doesn't depend on the damping ratio. So over here, we can put a, plot, a point right here. And that's the only point on that, on that phase plot, right? Okay. Great, we are, we're, we're really trucking now. Let's go ahead now and uh, before we leave this natural frequency, maybe let me add like a case, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I wanna call it like a B star or something like that here, but maybe we should. Let, let, let's, let, let's call it case B star, right? Remember, in one of our previous videos, uh, we talked about resonant frequency and how the resonant frequency of a second order system is not the same thing as the natural frequency. So it might behoove us to actually take a few minutes here and ask ourselves, what does the natural frequency look like at the resonant frequency, not the natural frequency? So let's go with case B star here at resonant frequency. Right? Because we claim this is where you would get the maximum deflection here. So I want to look at when omega is equal to omega r here. Okay? So again, if you recall from that previous lecture here, the, nat uh, the resonant frequency of a second order system was given by this. Square root of 1 minus 2 zeta squared. Right? Okay, so what we need to do now is look at magnitude, or I guess more importantly, we need to look at... 20 times log base 10 of the magnitude of G of J omega resonant, right? Okay, and again, all you got to do here is plug in this expression into here everywhere you see omega here. And again, it's just algebraic boring manipulation at that point. What you're going to end up with here is, hoo, 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 okay, is, is this. You'll end up with minus 10 times log base 10 of negative 4 zeta squared times zeta squared minus 1. Great. Okay. All right. So, um, again, we better ask ourselves the question of where does it make sense to evaluate this here? What we're interested in looking at are places where you have a bump here, right? So let's maybe write this down here. So we want to evaluate at locations where there is a maximum. So basically this concept of resonance where we want to see the Bode plot go up and then come back down here. So we see some kind of peak here. And remember from our last discussion here uh, on resonant frequencies, we saw that that only occurs here when zeta is in the range of zero to one over root two, right? 
Okay, so uh, why don't we go ahead and look at that here. So what we can look at here is we can look at this expression when zeta is zero or when zeta is say root two. So let's again, write down a little table here of, I want to look at 20 times log base 10 of the magnitude of G of J omega resonance, right? Is equal to, it's basically a table where it's a function of zeta here, right? So again, let's write down a table of zeta here and then let's go ahead and write down the value here of this expression here. So let's go ahead and make ourselves a table here and we see that to, to, to bookend this, I wanna start here at zero and then we're only gonna go up to one over root two or 0.707, right? Because anything above, the, any damping ratios above this, yes, you have a value here of the of the of the Bode plot at that point, but it's not a bump here, right? It's this monotonically decreasing scenario here. Um, okay, so again, here at zero, you plug in zero to this expression for zeta here, you get 10, minus 10 log base 10 of zero. This is basically infinite here, right? So um, again, here you would get infinity, infinity here, right? And then down here at uh, 0.707, if you point, put in one over root two to this whole expression up there, you would end up with, uh, with zero, <laughs> okay? And now let's just fill out this table in between. So again, go over to Mathematica or MATLAB, whatever you want, put in 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and then here's 0 0.707. Okay, so at 0 0.1, you plug this thing in, you get something like 14.0 dBs, then you get, this is 8.14, uh, you get 4.85, 2 6.9, 1.24, uh, 0.35, and 0.001, and then finally you get here to 0. Okay, so this is interesting. So the, at the resonant frequency, again, you can kind of calculate, this is the maximum peaks of where the Bode plot is gonna be at any given zeta value. Also notice here that the resonant frequency changes with zeta here, right? So what that means here is not all of these points lie on the natural frequency because as we discussed in our previous lecture, the natural frequency is not the same thing as the resonant frequency. So in fact, what this is gonna look like here is, um, you would have something like, like for zeta of 0.1 here, the resonant frequency for zeta equals 0.1 is actually somewhere a little bit lower, right? You can actually see that right here. <laughs> Right, because if this is 0.1, this whole term is one minus something, so this is smaller. So basically, it's knocking, it's it's lower than the natural frequency. In fact, the resonant frequency is always lower than the natural frequency in this in this regime here, right? So here, the resonant frequency for 0.1 might be over here. But what we end up with is you end up with a higher peak than this. So in other words, what I'm trying to get at here, maybe I should just draw it rather than keep discussing and confusing everyone here. You'd end up with a point like this. And, and again, I guess this is not accurate here. It should be, it should be about at 14 here. So again, it's, it's, it's maybe like a little bit higher <laughs> over here. <laughs> right? So these here, this is two points on the Bode plot. This is at resonance. Right, and this point is at the natural frequency, so slightly different here. And again, what ends up happening is this pattern changes here as the damping ratio changes. So here, maybe like these two are for point, both for point 0.5 here, right? Again, this is the resonant point, this is the point at the natural frequency, et cetera, et cetera, here, right? Okay, so you're starting to get an idea here that what happens is this Bode plot, it goes up and down and you get these peaks, but you only get these bumps here, like we talked about here, if your damping ratio is less than 0.707 here, okay? Okay, great, um, let's keep going then. Let's now leave case B star and go finally to our last case of case C. Okay, all right. So at case C, what we were interested in was large frequencies or high frequencies, frequencies big relative to the natural frequency, right? So case C here was at high frequencies. In other words, omega is much, much greater than omega n, right? So in this case, this 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of G of J omega, right? 
is basically let's now make the approximation and like go ahead and play play the normal games that we play uh, up here and you notice here if omega is much bigger than omega n if you look at this th this term is going to dominate here right because it's raised to the fourth power versus raised something just squared and this one is going to do diddly squat right it's not going to matter so this whole thing is going to be swamped by this term so this is basically the same thing as minus 10 times log base 10 of omega over omega n to the fourth right that's the same thing so great falling off the log here what do we end up with here this is basically going to end up with minus 40 times log base 10 of omega over omega n right and let's use our our trick of breaking apart um a quotient in a logarithm so this is minus 40 times log base 10 of omega um plus 40 log base 10 of omega n right so this is what our expression ends up looking like right and again you end up with this thing over here is the y value is equal to some slope m times here's your x-axis and then here's your y-intercept a y is equal to mx plus b here so we see now that at high frequencies the, the, the magnitude plot in decibels basically follows a line with a slope of minus 40 decibels per decade. So out here at higher frequencies, this thing just breaks down, but now at not 20 decibels per decade, but 40 decibels per decade. Whoops, the wrong color. 40 decibels per decade, right? So oh, da, 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 da. Uh, let me see if I can sketch this thing. So this is like minus... And this slope here is negative 40 decibels per decade, right? So here we go. We can start finally sketching this thing out. So you can see, like, depending on your damping ratio here, depends how high this spike is. But otherwise, um, this thing looks something like this, right, from the, fa uh, from the magnitude plot. And if you think about this long enough and compare it to a result of a single pole, remember, a single pole was flat and then broke down at negative 20 decibels per decade. Well, a complex conjugate pair of poles is really like two poles here, right? So instead of going down at 20 decibels per decade, it's going down at double that or 40 decibels per decade. And all the imaginary part of that pole does here is it potentially adds some kind of bump in this. As long as your damping ratio is less than one over root two, you'll get a bump. Otherwise, it's gonna look a heck of a lot like a normal pole, uh, double pole system where it just comes flat here and then starts rolling down here like such. Right. So again, to, to recap here, you only get bumps if zeta is in the range of zero to one over root two. Right. That's the only time this plot starts to look a little bit interesting. Right. OK. The last thing we got to finish out is our phase here. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Um, the phase, it's a little hard to deal with due to some of these discontinuities here with the, uh, the ATAN2 flipping from minus pi to pi. So the easiest thing to do here is um, I would just go ahead and numerically do this here and show that, you know, the magnitude of G of J omega here, when omega is large here, you can basically show that this is, uh, for all zetas and omega n's, you basically get minus pi or minus 180. And again, you can do this numerically. If you want to do some analysis, you can here by just plugging it in. Um, I know this is maybe a little unsatisfying, but I guarantee you if you plug in any omega n and omega, any zeta, as long as your, your, your frequencies are larger than your natural frequency, this is what you end up with. So your plot ends up looking like this. Let's, let's extend this down. Got to go all the way down to, uh, I guess this is pi over two, so maybe minus pi is down here, right? So at high frequencies, it's, it's this, right? Minus 180 degrees of phase shift here, right? So uh, again, what I think we can end up doing here is sketching this thing out where you start here at zero until one decade before, and then what's interesting about this is we're gonna see this numerically in a second here. It might be tempting to just draw this line to go in between and that's a pretty good approximation. What we're gonna end up seeing here is this slope here is gonna start depending on zeta. So as zeta gets uh, more uh, lower and lower, this thing is gonna start looking a little bit like this, 
So the roll off or this 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 phase lag going from zero to minus 180 starts to get more and more abrupt here as zeta decreases. So this is the direction of decreasing zeta here. But they all go through this point here where at the natural frequency, the phase is um, minus 90 degrees here, right? We showed that earlier, right? Okay, so with that being said, I think we can come up with a couple of rules here or how to sketch these Bode plots here. So um, how can we do this for our pair of complex conjugate poles here? So again, here's our rough sketching rules. Okay, so for the magnitude in decibels, right, what's sort of the rules here, right? So um, rule one here is this thing remains at zero dB when omega is less than omega n. So basically we saw you draw it here until you kind of get somewhere near omega n and then you stop it from being zero. Now, what you can then do, step two here, is you can go ahead and compute the magnitude at omega is equal to omega n using the formula we just did earlier, right? So you can use uh, 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega n right this was equal to minus 20 times log base 10 of 2 zeta right so that will give you these dots here right along the red line which is at, na at the natural frequency right okay then what you could also do if you really cared about this um again this step three might be optional actually heck maybe uh, tell you what let, let me finish this and we'll, I'll, I'll add some commentary here so you could also go ahead and if you wanted to increase the fidelity of your sketch here you could compute the magnitude at omega is equal to the resonance fre frequency right using our rule we had earlier so first um we, we said you might want to do a little if check here right so if uh, zeta is in the range of 0 to 1 over root 2, right? This is the situation where you had a bump here, right? Well, the resonance frequency would be omega n times square root of 1 minus 2 zeta squared, right? And then the magnitude, or the 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega resonance, right? This was just going to be negative 10 times log base 10 of negative 4 zeta squared times the quantity of zeta squared minus 1. Right? Okay. Else, right, if you're not in this damping ratio, if the damping ratio is between now uh, 0.707 to 1 here, well, there's, there's no bump here, right? So in this case, there's no bump, and the, the plot is just monotonically decreasing. So in other words, if you were in that situation, your thing would come across here and then it just starts, it keeps going down. It never bumps up here, right? Okay, great. Then let's end this thing. Let's end this if statement. Okay. All right. And then lastly, step four here is at high frequencies, we see that this thing, it decreases with slope of minus 40 decibels per decade, right? when omega is much, much bigger than omega n, right? Great, okay, so that's the rules of how to sort of sketch the magnitude plot here. How about the phase? Let's come up with a, with a similar set of rules for the phase here. So I guess I'm gonna have to erase this. I hope you've got all that down. Um, the phase plot is something similar, but not actually as involved here. So the phase, the way you sketch that here is, okay, the first rule here is this thing remains at zero degrees here, or zero radians, when omega is much, much less than the natural frequency. So again, about one decade before is where I would stop here, right? Now, the second rule that we should know here is that the magnitude of G of J at the natural frequency here, oh, sorry, the angle here at the natural frequency, this is minus pi over two, or minus 90 degrees, right? So that's this dot right here. That is an exact point on your plot, right? 
Okay, and then the third thing here is that we see that uh, at high frequencies, it's basically minus pi here. So this thing remains at minus pi or minus 180 degrees at omega greater than omega n, right? At high frequencies, you end up with this flat part just way out, okay? Now, the thing where it gets interesting here is, step four here is that the damping ratio, zeta, right? This kind of controls the aggressiveness, so to speak, of this cutoff here, right? Determines or controls the aggressiveness of the cutoff. Right? Okay, so uh, so great. This gives us a reasonable way of going ahead and sketching this. So the thing to think about here is, again, what this shows us is that for a pair of complex poles here, you end up with bumps here in your Bode plot only if your damping ratio is sufficiently low enough here. Um, and it basically acts like two poles, right? Because that, that is what a pair of complex poles are, right? It's like two real poles that happen to have a little bit of imaginary component. So the imaginary component just adds this uh, little bit here. So I think it would actually be really helpful if we ran over to MATLAB actually, and let's draw exact Bode plots of these pair of complex conjugate pairs for a couple of different varying um, zetas. All right, so let's go ahead and augment our script here to add, I think we're on to number, uh, component number five, which was a pair of complex conjugate poles, right? Okay, so let's pick a damping ratio um, of how about zeta of 0 0.1 and a natural frequency of 10 here. Okay, so then what we can do here is, uh, again, define our transfer function here. So the numerator in this case was 1, whoops. 1, and the denominator in this case, again, making sure that we're writing this in the uh, standardized uh, Bode plot format here. So I'm going to put this as 1 over omega n squared, and then 2 times zeta all over omega n, and then a 1 here, right? Okay, so here we go. I'll make my transfer function out of this thing. And that's my transfer function for my complex pair of poles here. Okay, so what I can now do when I'm trying to sketch this thing is we could actually go ahead and compute the magnitude at the natural frequency omega n, right? We said that that was, let's call it a variable, I don't know, call it magnitude at omega n or something like that here. And this was minus 20 times log base 10 of two times zeta, right? And tell you what, I'm gonna leave it uh, un, uh, with no semicolon just so we can print that out to the screen and see what's going on. Now, the next thing that we could do here is we could compute the magnitude at the resonance frequency, right, if it exists, right? So we had to first check that if zeta was basically less than or equal to 1 over square root of 2, right? And if that was the case here, then the resonance frequency existed and it was not imaginary, and that was given by omega n times square root of 1 minus 2 times zeta squared, right? Um, and then the magnitude at omega r, right, was minus 10 times log base 10 of minus 4 times zeta squared times the quantity zeta squared minus 1. Great. There we go. So what we can now do here is, uh, finally, let's go ahead and just make a Bode plot of this. So again, figure Bode of G here, and we'll call, we'll turn the grid on, and this will be a pair of complex conjugate poles with zeta equal to, what do we have here? Uh, I'll just print that out here. And omega n equal to, there we go. Okay, uh, I think that sounds good. Why don't we go ahead and run this and take a look at what we've got here. So, Here's our transfer function here, and here it looks like, again, the magnitude at the natural frequency we predict should be exact, well, not predict, we calculate, it should be 13.97. The resonance frequency is a little bit lower than the natural frequency, you can see, and we see that the magnitude is a little bit higher, right? Because the whole definition of resonance frequency was, that was the frequency at which you get the maximum amplification here. So this should be the maximum value of the Bode plot. And the Bode plot showed up on the, uh, another screen, so I will grab it and drag it and bring it over here and maybe let's take a look and compare some of these results and we see that again yeah this all seems to check out so at low frequencies it's zero but then we have a resonance peak up here 
at uh, again, you know, due to numerical errors, maybe we don't exactly hit 14, but we get pretty close. I, there, okay, there we go. There, right there. And and look at this. Here's your resonance frequency, just like we predicted here. And then this thing just starts dropping off at minus 40 decibels per decade as we go on. Now, again, this was for a damping ratio of 0.1. It might be interesting to see how does this change as the damping ratio changes here. So what I'm going to do here is let's come up here. And actually, maybe how about we wrap all of this in a for loop. And let's make zeta, let's make a range of zeta. So let's say zeta can go from 0 0.1 by 0 0.1 up to 0 0.9. How about? And uh, again, let's just wrap all this thing in a for loop. And we will just change zeta every iteration through the loop, right? Okay, and then I'm going to put an end at the end of this. There we go. So this whole thing is going to be in a for loop, and I'm going to smart indent the whole thing. And actually, I don't want a new figure every single time, so I'm going to pull this new figure uh, initialization outside the for loop. And the last thing here, just to give us enough time to see what's going on here, um, I'm going to have MATLAB pause for one second in between each one of the Zetas, just so we can see how the thing changes here, so it doesn't plot super duper quick. So um, let's go ahead and hit run, and I will drag it over the, the plot over to this screen, and we should be able to watch how does that pair of complex conjugate poles plot change as Zeta starts increasing from 0 0.1 up to 0 0.9. Okay, so I'm going to hit run here, and give it a second, and I'll pull it over. Here we go. Here we go. So here's, oh, we're already at 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. You can see the peak is going down here, and we're about to hit 0 0.707. So here we go. And now after this, you can see that basically it's overdamped here, and this looks just like two real poles here. Well, sorry, sorry, it's not overdamped, right? But it's past the critically damped version of 0 0.707. So all of these are still technically underdamped poles, but you can see what ended up happening here, right? Is that peak goes away, so we no longer have a bump and a and a resonant frequency after zeta increases past 0 0.707 and you can see that this transition here from 0 to minus 180 degrees of phase gets more and more sort of uh, gentle here or gradual as zeta increases so again tell you what maybe let's let's watch that one more time here and i realized that was a little bit fast maybe let's put a pause of two seconds in between each time and that'll give us some time to look at it so i'll hit run again and i'll pull the plot over here we go okay here's 0 0.1 0 0.2 Point three, and you can see that the peak is starting to get smashed, and this transition was pretty aggressive, but now it's getting gentler and gentler. But again, notice here that at the natural frequency, it is always minus 90 degrees. So that's an exact calculation. It always goes through this point. This point where my mouse is right now never changes, right? Okay, so there you go. That was our pair of complex conjugate poles. Let's jump back over to the whiteboard and see what happens with the pair of complex conjugate zeros. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at our case number six here, right? Which was a pair of complex conjugate zeros. And actually, if you notice here on the board, I actually haven't erased the results that we got for our pair of complex conjugate poles here. Um, and that's going to be evident why in a second here. But maybe one thing I will do is let's, uh, let's maybe label this. If you remember up here, this was our complex conjugate poles right here and then maybe let's expand our expression for the um, for the angle here so if you had uh, expanded our complex conjugate poles here and just use a normal one quadrant inverse here you could get that the phase here for your complex conjugate poles so I think we showed this earlier here this was tan inverse of uh, 2 zeta omega omega n all over omega squared minus omega n squared. Okay, so again, this is all of our complex conjugate poles. Now we're talking about a pair of complex conjugate zeros here, right? So the process is basically the exact same, right? So now what we're going to do here is consider a uh, transfer function which just looks like um, uh, s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared all over omega n squared here. And again, we're going to renormalize this and write this in the standardized Bode plot format where I want the constant of the uh, numerator to be a 1. So in other words, I want to write this as um, 1 over omega n squ uh, squared 
times s squared plus 2 zeta all over omega n s plus 1 here, right? And I guess you can write this over 1 if you really want to here, okay? So by this time, you guys have all gotten uh, the flavor of how this works, right? So I need to go ahead and calculate g of j omega, right? So you're going to go ahead and plug in j omega everywhere up there. And let's see, what are we going to end up with here? Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, so this will be basically be, a, you know, an imaginary number, right? Alpha plus beta i here, right? Uh, if you do all of the algebraic manipulations here, and I'll save you the, the trouble that, in fact, we'll go over and do this in Mathematic in a second. In terms of the alpha and beta are pretty trivial here. They're, they're much nicer to deal with. So this is 1 minus omega all over omega n squared here. And the beta term, the imaginary part of this imaginary number is 2 zeta omega over omega n here, right? Okay, so great. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to calculate magnitude of g of j omega. Right, which is just our normal square root alpha squared plus beta squared. Okay, and then what we're going to do here is we're going to do our normal 20 times log base 10 of that, right? So we're going to do 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega, right? And I'm going fast here because I don't want to do all these manipulations on the board because you've seen it uh, several times already. We'll just quickly do it in Mathematica in a second to prove to you it. But um, what you could end up getting here at the end of the day here is when you go through all of that, you basically end up with, this is uh, 10 times log base 10 of uh, the quantity omega over omega n to the fourth plus 2 times 2 zeta squared minus 1 uh, times quantity omega over omega n squared plus 1 here, okay? And similarly, we would also do angle of g of j omega right and again this is just uh tan inverse of beta over alpha right which would be tan inverse if you plug in the beta and alpha you get there this would come out to be um two zeta omega n no sorry sorry two zeta times omega times omega n all over omega squared minus omega n squared and actually there would be a minus sign here. So this is angle of G of J omega, right? So maybe let's box this up. Here's your angle formula. And here is your magnitude formula for your pair of complex conjugate zeros. And the reason you can see now of why we left this up here is if you compare, this is the expression for the magnitude of a pair of complex conjugate zeros it looks exactly like the magnitude of a pair of complex conjugate poles, except there's a sign, an S-I-G-N, right? There's, there's a minus sign here, there's a plus sign here. Similarly, for the angle, right, again, you get the exact same expression, except there's just a negative sign in front of it here, right? So what does that mean? That means, again, we see this, this nice duality between the poles and the zeros here. Everything we had uh, that we discussed for the pair of complex conjugate uh, poles applies to the pair of complex conjugate zeros. All you do here is you take both your magnitude and your phase plot here, and, and what do you do? You just you flip those suckers like a blueberry pancake on Sunday morning, right? You just flip it over the the uh, the x-axis here. So uh, I would butcher it if I tried to do this, but you can easily imagine just mirror imaging and flipping this thing uh, top to bottom here, right? So the complex conjugate zero analysis is, is really simple. Everything we talked about it from the complex conjugate poles apply here. You just inverted here. So if you don't believe me, let's run over to Mathematica here to prove that A, this is the actual expression for magnitude in decibels as well as the phase angle. And then we'll just get a couple of Bode plots and let's just see that they actually are just inverted of one another. All right, so here we are. Let's go ahead and verify those claims that we just made about our pair of complex conjugate pole, uh, zeros, excuse me. So let's go ahead and define the transfer function like we've done in the past, right? So g of s is going to be 1 over omega n squared s squared plus 2 zeta over omega n uh, times s plus 1 here. Okay. All right, great. So now let's go ahead and uh, evaluate... Uh, g of j omega, right? And we want to get this in a 
real plus an imaginary form, right? So the the real part is let's go ahead and just go ahead and do a complex expand on the real part of g of i omega, right? Or j omega, right? That's alpha, and then here's beta would be the exact same thing here, except I want the imaginary part of that complex number. And here we go. This is exactly what we wrote on the board here. So now let's go ahead and calculate the magnitude of g of j omega, right? So that's just our good old friend alpha squared plus beta squared square rooted. And maybe what we ought to do here is let's simplify this guy or maybe full simplify this with the uh, restrictions here that omega n is greater than zero. All of our frequencies are greater than zero and our damping ratio is greater than zero. Okay, and maybe let's assign this thing to a variable call it magnitude of g of j omega. There we go. All right, now all we need to do here is convert to uh, units of decibels here, right? So magnitude of g of j omega in decibels is just 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega. There we go. And now what we have to do here is we, whoopsie, oh crud, I hit the wrong thing. Nope, don't do that. All right, uh, shift enter, let's get that back in there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so what we need to do now is we claimed that this was equal to uh, a big expression. And again, just to make sure that I don't, don't fat finger push plug that in incorrectly i've got that thing prepared off screen here this was what we wrote on the whiteboard right we, which we said was the exact same thing as the pair of complex conjugate poles except there's no minus sign here it's a positive right so what i need to do here is we need to check here that okay what we actually showed here from first principles is that equal to this giant expression right here and again to avoid me messing something up when i type it in let's go ahead and just punch it in like such, right? We just want to make sure that those two are the exact same expressions. And if I shift enter that in, I don't quite get everything I need here. But if we full simplify this thing, and again, give it some restrictions here that all of the natural frequencies and frequencies and damping ratios and all of those kind of things are positive here, you shift enter that, and yay, they are true. So we validated that this is the right expression. So we do see that, yeah, again, the magnitude plot in decibels is just the the uh, the negative of the magnitude plot um, for the poles here, okay? So now, again, let's do the same for the angle here, right? So let's go ahead and calculate angle of G of J omega, right? Which we said was tangent inverse of beta over alpha, right? That's what we got from first principles. And what we did is, again, we claimed that this was the same as, what did we have earlier? It was um, an expression here of, wait, now wait a second, did I? Angle G of J omega. No, no, I think that's, yeah. That's right. Okay, so we claim that this thing was the same as this expression here, right? Okay, so let's again just check that, right? We need to check that the angle of G of J omega is actually equal to the minus arctangent of the quantity 2 zeta omega omega n all over omega squared, whoopsies, all over omega squared minus omega n squared, right? Make sure those two things are the same. And again, that didn't quite come out here, but I bet if I tell Mathematica to simplify that, if I can get it to, to do the tab correction, simply, there we go, all right. Let's try that. Shift enter. Yay, they're true. So again, we see that the phase is is also just the phase for the zeros is the negative of the phase for the complex poles. Okay, so what that means here is if we come over here to MATLAB, let's let me pull Mathematica out of the way here. Let's augment our MATLAB script here just to, to, to view that for sure. So I can basically take the exact same thing I had for my pair of complex conjugate poles and let's copy that, and maybe just so I don't have to watch this every single time, let's go ahead and just comment this out here. So I'll comment out that entire section for now, and I'm just going to paste down here, and I can just change this to be, okay, this is item number six. It's pair of complex conjugate zeros. So everything is the same except, all right, here we go. I need to now just switch the numerator and the denominator here, right? Right? 
And now everything is the same except the sign. S I G N of these magnitudes are different. So instead of this being negative, this is a positive. The uh, resonance frequency is still the same thing, except its magnitude is now a positive, right? And I'll just change the title of this to be pair of complex conjugate zeros, right? Great, and now let's just run this and give it a second here, and I'll pull this over to the other side so you can see, and it's pausing every t two seconds. And you can see, yep, again, it, this looks exactly like we saw earlier, except the, z the it, it's just the negative here, right? So again, we still see these bumps, but now these bumps are almost like bumps in attenuation, not amplification, right? Because it's going down here. And um, again, the, it still goes from zero up to positive 180 degrees, and it always passes through uh, positive 90 degrees at the natural frequency. So there you have it. Actually, the pair of complex conjugate zeros uh, again, displays this nice duality with the poles here. It's basically just the negative of the poles. So let's jump over to the whiteboard and take care of our very last component that we need to discuss, which is a static gain. All right, we're here in the home stretch, and we've actually saved the easiest one for last. So component number seven here was just a static gain here. In other words, the transfer function, it actually wasn't a function of s. It was just a constant number k here, a static gain. So this makes it really easy. So the uh, g of j omega, right, is again just k here, right? So the magnitude of g of j omega it's just k here. So 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega is just 20 times log base 10 of k, <laughs> right? And what's even easier, the angle of g of j omega, right? It's just a real number, so that's just zero. Zero degrees, zero radians, whatever. And again, the, the omega doesn't show up anywhere here. So this is really, really simple. So for example here, right? If you had a gain of k is equal to like 3, right? We go 20 times log base 10 of 3 is something like, uh, I think it's like uh, 9 point, or uh, what is that, like 9.5 or something like that? Yeah, I think it's like 9.54 or something like that. So what you end up with here is the Bode plot is really, really simple here. So it's just constant here at 9.54. You just get a constant line for all omegas. And similarly, your phase is zero all the time, right? That's what you get. And again, this makes perfectly good sense if you just think about what does this transfer function look like, g of s, right? It's just a constant static gain k. So you put in a sine wave of a sine omega t, what comes out the other end is just a times k sine omega t. Right, so the the amplitude has just been amplified by a factor of k, and there is no phase shift in here again, which is what this is saying here. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this here. Why don't I go ahead and um, erase the board here, and let's summarize with a couple of things that we can take away of what we discussed during this entire lecture. Okay, so why don't we summarize what we talked about today? So. If you remember, one thing I want to note here and make sure we're all on the same page with is that all the previous analysis um, assumed here that you wrote the transfer function in standard Bode plot form. We're going to see later that you could get into trouble if you uh, neglect to do this. So what I mean by that is, again, let's review all of the components we looked at here. So the first one here was our single pole at origin. Or, sorry, I'm, excuse me, single, single real pole. <laughs> single real pole was our first one, right? Okay, and we wanted to then make sure that you uh, write the transfer function like this. Right, so again, the DC gain was one and the constant in the denominator was one here, right? We also looked at here a single real zero, right? And that looked very similar here, where again, you just needed to make sure that the constant in the numerator was one and again, the DC gain was one here, right? Next, we looked at here a single pole at origin, right? And again, that looks like this, a pure integrator. Okay, and then we analyze a single zero at the origin here, right? Which again was just our pure derivative s here. 
And then we looked at the ones that were really interesting, right? This was a pair of complex conjugate poles, right? So again, to make sure this was in standard form here, you had to make sure that you manipulate the transfer function to look something like this, right? One over omega n squared, s squared plus two zeta all over omega n s plus one. So again, you see DC gain is one and the constant in the denominator is one here, right? Okay, and then we looked at complex conjugate zeros, which was very similar here. Uh, 1 over omega n squared, s squared, plus 2 zeta all over omega n s plus 1, right? And then finally we looked at a constant gain, right? Where you just had a k here, okay? And for all of these individual components here, we saw that there were a couple of... Uh, similarities here, right? So what we saw here is one thing that we noticed that was in common here is pretty much all poles, they, they do what? They break down at a slope of minus 20 decibels per decade, starting at approximately the pole location or the natural frequency, right? That was kind of the idea here, right? Most of these poles, again, they, I guess with the exception here of the integrator here, which uh, was, is always going down at negative 20 decibels per decade. If you want to take one thing away from this discussion, just remember, hey, a pole is going to introduce a slope in the magnitude of about negative 20 decibels per decade. Conversely here, all zeros, right, they break up at a rate of positive 20 decibels per decade. So any zero here, and again, this is going to be starting at approximately the pole location or natural frequency, right? The same idea. So again, if you want to just think about one thing to think about when you see a zero, just think that it's going to introduce a positive slope in your magnitude plot. What about the phase here? Maybe we should say these were some, some things to take away for the magnitude. Right? For the phase here, right, we saw that pretty much all poles eventually introduce um, a phase shift of minus 90 degrees here, right? So each single pole you'll lose 90 degrees here, right? Similarly, for the zeros, all zeros eventually introduce a phase shift of positive 90. So again, we saw this nice duality here, right? So here was your rules of thumb here for the phase, right? And again, these all apply here. Even for the case of like complex conjugates, you basically look at this as two poles here, right? So two poles means that each one of those poles gives you negative 20 decibels. So overall, the pair gives you minus 40 decibels per decade. And overall, you lose 180 degrees of phase. So again, this hopefully was very helpful for understanding um, how all of the different components here, these seven different components, how do their Bode plots individually look? Now, I know what you're probably thinking here. You're like, okay, this is great that we know how all seven of these work here, but you never see a Bode plot or, a, excuse me, you never see a transfer function that is just one of these things sitting by themselves, right? How are you going to deal with the case that you have a general transfer function where it might look something like, I don't know, uh, 20 times s plus 2, s squared plus 3s plus 14, all over s, s plus 6. Something like this, right? This is a more complicated transfer function. How can we go ahead and apply those different seven components that we learned about to try to understand what the Bode plot is for that more complicated function. And I hope um, you'll join us actually at our next video where we're gonna do exactly that. We're gonna look at how to use what we built today to understand and predict what the Bode plot is for a more complicated system here. Okay, so um, with that, I think that closes out what I wanted to cover today here when we're talking about understanding and trying to plot individual Bode plot components. So I hope you enjoyed the video here. If so, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me keep uh, making these videos. And like I said, we're gonna be tackling some uh, more complicated issues and building off of this foundation in some of the following videos. So I hope to catch you at one of those future ones. So until then, I'll talk to you later. Bye.